to Jesus Christ. Glory forever. That's how we greet each other in the Byzantine rite. We say glory to Jesus Christ. As you heard, you would say back to me, glory to him forever. Translated, hi or hello. So glory to Jesus Christ and welcome to Theosis. I am Father Thomas Loya. And, and I'm Jack Siegel. And if you're just joining us, welcome. And if you've seen us before, I'd like to welcome you back. And just in review, especially those of you who might be new, this program is called Theosis. And the word Theosis, very simply, put it briefly, means that pillar of spirituality that is shared by both lungs of the church, east and west, but particularly the eastern lung of the church, that pillar of spirituality that says life is all about a constant, ongoing growth more and more into the image and likeness of God. A growth that never stops. It's the whole point of our life, the whole spiritual journey, is this deification, this becoming more and more like unto God. That's the origins, purpose, and destiny of the human person. So in this program, we share with you some of the riches of the Eastern churches, which hopefully will help you in your process of theosis. And today, we're going to look at the Melkite Byzantine Church. Right, Jack? Yes. Uh, today we have, as our first segment, the Divine Liturgy that was celebrated by His Beatitude Patriarch Gregorius of the Melkite Greek Catholic Church. Patriarch Gregorius resides in the Middle East, splitting his time between Beirut and Damascus, depending on where the fighting is not yes. <laughs> these days. And um, in 2007, he led a pilgrimage of his whole church from around the world to Rome for the year of St. Paul. And while in Rome, among other special events and things, including a private audience with then Pope Benedict, we had a liturgy at the Basilica of St. Paul outside the wall, a very, very large basilica, one of the four great basilicas of Rome. And there, of course, is a tradition that the relics of St. Paul the Apostle are entombed. Uh, there's a very large statue out in front. And the basilica is uh, somewhat in uh, a Byzantine style in that it has very large mosaics up in the apse, mm. especially behind, by, behind the altar. This liturgy was conducted mostly in Arabic with some Greek, um, so there's no English you'll hear, but we will uh, provide some commentary and uh, so forth to explain what's going on. This particular clip is only one out of about an hour and a half liturgy, so it's only a, a small segment toward the beginning of the liturgy uh, when the patriarch uh, begins from the high place, uh, the chair behind the altar, and then the gospel procession brings the word of God, the incarnate word, uh, to the altar, and the patriarch then begins the rest of the liturgy by incensing the people in the altar. So that's the, uh, the portion we'll see today. So let's now have a look at the Melkite Greek Catholic Liturgy from Rome. So Jack, you attended this liturgy. Yes, that's right. It was in Rome in 2007 for the year of St. Paul. And it was a Melkite liturgy held in the Basilica of St. Paul outside the walls. 
equipped by Melkite, we also mean the Byzantine liturgy. That's right. See, the, the word Byzantine is kind of an umbrella term. It, it refers to a particular liturgical tradition in which there are a number of jurisdictions. The Melkite jurisdiction refers to those who follow the Byzantine spirituality and liturgy, but who are located largely in areas such as Syria and Lebanon. And also the Melkites uh, generally follow more of a Greek style of service, whereas the Ruthenians and Ukrainians like ourselves follow a more Slavic uh, custom and tradition. They're 98% the same, but have a few variations. Right. This is what we mean by the different jurisdictions, but yet following the same Byzantine rite. Now in this liturgy, what we've just heard is the end of the great doxology and the great litany at the beginning of the liturgy. Uh, this is about 10 minutes into this particular uh, event. Uh, and there was a small scola of seminarians that came to chant. Uh, and uh, we are hearing a combination of Greek and Arabic as the languages of this particular service. They are now doing the psalms that represent the antiphons of the beginning of the liturgy uh, with a verse in between. Uh, and again, uh, they're singing in this particular case in Arabic. From this angle, we can see a priest in the, the black hat and veil at the altar, but behind the altar in red is the patriarch, Patriarch Gregorius of the Melkites, and the synod of bishops that came with him on this pilgrimage. In many Eastern Catholic jurisdictions, and certainly in, in all the Orthodox jurisdictions, these, these churches have what's called patriarchs, as Jack just mentioned. A patriarch means something like their own pope. In many these jurisdictions, such as Eastern Catholic patriarchs, and their jurisdictions can, of course, and are, of course, in union with the Pope of Rome. Mm -hmm. And as they're chanting these uh, psalm verses, you saw the priest starting to carry the gospel book in procession. Uh, they will process around the congregation and come down the center aisle in a few minutes and present the gospel book to the patriarch who's waiting for them at the altar. Here we have the procession coming. And during this time, this procession, they they sing, the, the, the people, the faithful sing the hymn of the Incarnation. And the, the meaning of this part of liturgy is the coming of, of our Lord into our world. In other words, the coming of the invisible God into the visible world by means of his birth, his nativity, his incarnation. This actually has its roots in what was the original entrance of the faithful into the church as they processed through the streets to the church designated for the liturgy of that day. Now, during a liturgy, that once exterior procession happens inside the church and has been sort of distilled down to this smaller, what we call in fact, the small entrance. <laughs> the custom in the ancient Byzantine times for the clergy and the laity to enter the church together. And again, this small entrance, this smaller procession is a remnant of that once rather more complex and grand procession of entrance into the church. And now after this, this little entrance, the main celebrant, in this case the patriarch himself, will incense the altar uh, and the congregation uh, to continue on with the liturgy. Notice how in the Eastern liturgies, especially in the Byzantine liturgy, the celebrants face the altar, or in other words, face east. two priests that go around the altar on the opposite side from the patriarch, 
carrying uh, a two candle and a three candlestick uh, assembly, you see. Uh, in Greek, the dikirion and trikirion. They are the special candles that the celebrant, in this case the bishop, uh, uses uh, through the course of the liturgy. And of course, when there's three and two, those numbers always represent the Trinity, the three persons of the Trinity, and the two natures of Christ. It's very impressive whenever the bishop blesses with those, aren't they? Isn't it, Jack? Yes. He and crosses them over and faces both four corners and so on. That's right, that's right. It struck me as I was there that with the patriarch himself serving in such a, a special event, a special moment, uh, that he actually had to work pretty hard as, as the main celebrant. He just didn't sit somewhere and everybody else did things. Uh, he took an awful strong active role in the entire liturgy. Now it's important for the viewers to realize too that normally if this liturgy was taking place in its in its own setting, in other words, a Byzantine church. Some of this you would not see because it would be concealed by a grand wall called the icon screen. But of course, this is a church in Rome, so it does not have that icon screen. On the icon screen would be three sets of doors, the middle ones being the royal doors, or the gates of heaven, through which only the ordained ministers go, and only at certain times and while fully vested. The other two doors are the doors through which the servers go. And they are all, these doors are also called the deacon's doors. Again, Jack, to be clear to our audience, the camera here, the angle they're seeing, is behind the altar. This is not where the people are standing. That's right. Um, I was able to get a camera placed up at the high throne at the back of the holy place uh, so that we could see the face of the patriarch and then all the people behind him. Uh, this, this angle now is from where the people are sitting. And once again, what church is this? This is the Basilica of St. Paul outside the walls one of the four major basilicas of Rome. And of course, for pilgrimage for the year of St. Paul, it was the appropriate place to have this, this liturgy. Rome is such a wonderful meeting place of east and west. Yeah. So yeah. even though the liturgy takes place in a church that is not particularly Byzantine at the same time, there is still a, a great sense of, of being at home here because this, yeah. Rome really is a meeting point of east and west. They are now singing the Trisagion hymn. The first stanza was sung in Greek, and now they are singing it in Arabic. Uh, and it's the same phrase three times. Holy God, Holy Mighty One, Holy Immortal One, have mercy on us. And then the patriarch now is singing it alone in Greek. People might notice the priests with the long black, looks like hats or robes or veils, but this is actually very traditional in the Eastern churches, and it comes from the monastic tradition. What you just saw was a portion of the Melkite Byzantine Catholic liturgy. And by the way, Melkite is a Greek Arabic word which means king. It referred to those Christians, as Jack was saying before, from the areas we now know today as, as Lebanon and Syria. Centuries ago was the great patriarchal seas of Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem. 
of those Christians which followed the Byzantine spirituality, who remained loyal to the Byzantine emperor, who himself embraced the teachings of the Council of Chalcedon, which was the resolution of a great Christological heresy. And so they were kind of tagged with that name, Melkite or king, because they were loyal to the king or the emperor. Our next segment, uh, segment number two in our regular series, will be a theological lecture. Again, we will have Archimandrite Robert Taft, S.J., a renowned Byzantine liturgist, a theologian, a retired professor from the Pontifical Oriental Institute in Rome. And uh, this is the second portion of his series of talks and lectures about prayer and liturgy, more specifically about personal prayer and how personal prayer is a, an, a, an important part of our lives and how he, through his many years of experience and his own spirituality, uh, has come to that. Uh, Father Taft stays with me in Washington when he visits, and I've seen him on more than one occasion sitting in my easy chair in the living room <laughs> with his little prayer books in Church Slavonic, saying his private prayers uh, all through the day. So uh, this is Father Taft's explanation and uh, teaching uh, to help us in our personal prayer. So now we'll hear from Father Taft. Spiritual writers describe many ways of prayer, some of them overlapping and more or less synonymous. There is liturgical prayer, vocal prayer, mental prayer, meditation, contemplation, Lexio Divina, Hesychia, or the prayer of quiet as it was called in the West. Some of these terms are open to misunderstanding, however. Mental prayer or meditation, for instance, might be mistaken for just thinking or reflecting which in itself is not prayer at all. And some spiritual writers devalue vocal prayer as if it were second rate, considered just words recited by rote, with no necessary interiority. Indeed, there have been times in the history of the Church when even liturgical prayer was looked on much in the same way and considered secondary to contemplation or interior prayer. The truth of the matter, however, is that most methods of prayer include all or at least several of the many ways of prayer. One contemplates an icon, meditates on a psalm or other spiritual text or spiritual topic. Reflection on this holy icon or divine word moves one's heart and inspires one to speak to God about what is on one's mind and in one's heart, and then to listen attentively for the response of His grace. The same with vocal prayer, or the prayer called Lexio Divina, spiritual reading in the ancient tradition of Western monasticism. It is not just spiritual reading of some pious text, but a slow, prayerful, meditative reading during which one pauses as the heart is moved to ponder and speak to God of what has moved one's spirit. This is the same as the classic second method of prayer, of St. Ignatius of Loyola's spiritual exercises. And St. Jean-Baptiste Marie Vianney, better known as the Curé d'Ars, recounts how one of his French peasant parishioners called contemplation a gaze of faith, a communion of love. When asked to describe his prayer before the tabernacle, he said, I look at Jesus, and he looks at me. All these ways of prayer are found, if under different names, in the classical Eastern and Western spiritual writers. One of my favorites is 19th century Russian Orthodox Bishop St. Feofan Zadvornik, or Theophan the Recluse, a spiritual master who lived from 1815 to 1894. Ordained a bishop in 1860, after six years he resigned and retired to a small monastery to live a life of prayer and seclusion. Feofan, who calls prayer standing before God with the mind in the heart, distinguishes three degrees of prayer, bodily or vocal prayer, prayer of the mind, and prayer of the heart, or prayer of the mind in the heart. Oral or vocal prayers, Feofan teaches, in an insight of genius, originated as purely spiritual prayers that only later became oral by being written down. When we pray them now, we must reverse the process, he writes, and enter into the spirit of the prayers which you hear and read 
reproducing them in your heart, and in this way offer them up from your heart to God, as if they had been born in your own heart under the action of the grace of the Holy Spirit. Then and then alone is the prayer pleasing to God. How can we attain such a prayer? Ponder carefully on the prayers which you have to read in your prayer book. Feel them deeply, even learn them by heart, and so when you pray you will express that which is already deeply felt in your heart. The same is true of the liturgical chants. Citing the teaching of St. John Chrysostom, St. Fiofan says, The songs must primarily be spiritually and sung not only by the tongue, but also by the heart. By the continual practice of this prayer with the mind and the heart, one's prayer becomes spiritualized and takes on a life of its own, becoming self-moving, as St. Fiofan calls it when prayer exists and acts on its own, that is to say, is moved by the grace of the Spirit and not by one's own human will. Slowly, words disappear from the prayer, which becomes the heart's wordless, unceasing prayer of love. There is nothing whatever in this description of progress in interior prayer that is foreign to Western spirituality, despite the frantic attempts of the cliché mongers to seek everywhere irreconcilable differences between East and West. The early Hesychists also evolved a physical method, a method of bodily posture and breathing techniques to foster this state of prayer, and there is something akin to it in the third method of prayer in St. Ignatius Loyola's spiritual exercises. But Fairfan and other authoritative 19th century Russian masters like Bishop Ignatsi Branchaninov were somewhat reticent with regard to this physical method. Basically, what these authors, East and West, are talking about is what I call the interiorizing of vocal and liturgical prayer, taking the written text and making it one's own by praying it in one's heart, so that when one returns to it again and again, it is no longer someone else's prayer, but has become the movement of one's own heart. This is the type of prayer that I like to recommend to those who have so much to do that they cannot themsel devote themselves totally to a life of prayer like a monastic hermit living in his skeet. I call it the prayer of the busy person, a way of prayer suitable for monastics as well as non-monastic priests and others busily engaged in the pastoral ministry. For those distracted by the cares of administering a parish, perhaps, while at the same time bringing up and supporting a family. This sort of life is very much like the one I live as a Jesuit, and this is the sort of prayer I have learned to do amidst the hectic cares of my work. Though vowed to the monastic ideal in the Eastern sense of the educated monks of orthodoxy engaged in the work of the Church, Jesuits lead a busy, active life in the world. The underlying Ignatian or Jesuit vision of this world, inherited from our founder St. Ignatius of Loyola, is that only God can save it, but that he has chosen to use us as instruments in so doing. One of my favorite prayers, that of St. Teresa of Avila, a contemporary of St. Ignatius in the 16th century, expresses this vision perfectly. The prayer says, Christ has no body now but yours. No hands but yours, no feet but yours. Yours are the eyes through which Christ's compassion must look out on the world. Yours are the feet with which he is to go about doing good. Yours are the hands with which he is to bless us now. The same vision is expressed in the Byzantine liturgical tradition by the feasts known as the Synaxis in Greek or Sabor in Slavonic, which fall in the liturgical calendar on the day following a major feast of salvation history. They celebrate the role of those human figures intimately associated with the saving mystery of the preceding day. Mary's parents, Saints Joachim and Anne on September 9th, the day after the nativity of the Theotokos. Mary the mother of God on December 26th, the day after the nativity of her divine son. John the Baptist on January 7th the day after the Theophany and Baptism of Jesus. All indicate the same doctrine of our faith, that by entering our human history through the incarnation 
of his divine Son, God willed to associate us in his work of salvation. That's what we call the church. The church is the body of those who are associated with God in his work of salvation. This vision, equally Ignatian and Byzantine, is fundamentally different from the modern humanistic and secular social ideal, which pretends that humans can of themselves create the society they choose, free of human despotism, historical determinism, and supernatural authority. But it is equally different from the ideal of early and eastern monasticism with its radical eschatological orientation and rejection of this world. On the contrary, Ignatian service and prayer, in the words of Jesuit Karl Rahner, whom many consider the greatest Catholic theologian of the 20th century, is rooted in a positive, amicable, and joyous relationship with the world. As the former Jesuit Father General Peter Hans Kolvenbach noted, Ignatian spirituality does not insist on seeking God outside of created things, but rather finding him in them and recognizing fully their autonomous existence in a state of dependence as created objects. The condition of this cooperation in God's design for the human race, however, is that we, the human instruments, be united with God. And that is where prayer comes in. Without prayer there is no such thing as a spiritual life, no possibility of being united with God, no chance of being his instrument in the salvation of the world, and I might add, no chance of living a happy and fulfilled religious or Christian life, for without prayer we are not living in and with God, and that is the monastic ideal which in the Eastern tradition is considered the ideal of all. Monasticism and Christian life is the life with God. As the Catechism of the Catholic Church states peremptorily, prayer is a vital necessity. Prayer and Christian life are inseparable. Immersed in this world, we need the bless this mess spirituality, so aptly expressed by Michael Hollings, the harried, overworked urban parish priest of St. Mary of the Angels in Bayswater, London, in an article in the April 29, 1988 London Tablet. Describing his years of study in Rome, Father Hollings recalls Bobby Dyson, a Byzantine Rite Jesuit I had the privilege of meeting and serving as cantor at his Divine Liturgy during my first visit to Rome in May 1959 on my way back to the United States from my years of teaching in Baghdad, Iraq in the 1950s, when I stayed at the Biblical Institute where Father Dyson was professor. Hollings describes how in Rome the most memorable lecturer was a Jesuit, Father Dyson of the Biblical Institute. In four years of scripture lectures we covered almost everything under heaven without ever moving beyond the first three chapters of Genesis. One phrase has always remained in my mind from Father Dyson's teaching about creation. The Hebrew for the early state of the earth was tohu and bohu, trackless waste and emptiness. Since I began to think and pray seriously, I have come to realize that tohu and bohu was not only the situation at the dawn of the world, but continues where I stand today. It is upon this formless mass, this mess, that God works. This so resonated with the way my life sometimes seems that I have saved that clipping these 24 years and still derive wry consolation from it every time I read it. The active life of a minister in today's church is tohu and bohu indeed, but we can give it form and shape through our prayer. Well, hopefully, as you're learning from Father Taft, that there's this great integration in the Byzantine, the Eastern spirituality, e even in terms of prayer, a liturgy and personal prayer. Different forms of prayer are not so much compartmentalized or separated out from each other, but they all form one kind of organic whole in which liturgy is the center of it. And now for our special events segment in this program, we have the visit of Pope Benedict XVI the Ecumenical Patriarchate of Constantinople that took place for the Feast of St. Andrew in November of 2006. 
I was privileged to be there. I made these video recordings from a perch that I had about a just a few feet from the patriarchal throne. And it was essentially in the center of the church. So in keeping with the ecumenical nature of our theosis programs, we'll provide some commentary of excerpts of the divine liturgy that was celebrated in the presence of His Holiness Pope Benedict. Now the entrance with the Gospel book, partway through the Divine Liturgy, the deacon brings the book to his all this Patriarch Bartholomew for him to venerate and kiss, and then presents it at the altar with the words Sophia, meaning wisdom, let us be attentive. Cantors and the people now sing, Come let us worship and bow before Christ. And during this time, the patriarch is about to enter the altar, and so he blesses the four corners of the world with the trikaria and dikaria. The trikaria meaning three, or the three candlestick candelabra and Dikiria meaning the two candles that he's holding in his hands. They of course symbolize the Trinity, three persons in one God, and the dual nature of Christ, both man and divine. Another blessing that the patriarch does, where he proclaims, O Lord, O Lord, look down from heaven and see. This is now the scene preparing for the proclamation of the gospel. The deacon has climbed the tall staircase to his perch in the center of the church, from which he will proclaim the gospel of the day. Now we get a chance to see sort of the size of the Patriarchal Cathedral of St. George. It has a couple of levels of balconies around the perimeter where many of the faithful were crammed in. And the church itself only can hold a few hundred people uh, spread throughout the main level. There are no pews, uh, only chairs uh, for the people to sit on. And lining each side of the church are choir stalls. We now see the great entrance where the priest who is the main celebrant so far until the patriarch has entered the altar is bringing the large chalice of wine in procession to the altar through the church for the patriarch then to commemorate the other patriarchs of the Orthodox churches in which he is communion with. And the first deacon is presenting him with the discos that contains the holy bread. Thank you. 
Just before the creed is when the kiss of peace takes place in the divine liturgy and the patriarch and Pope Benedict meet in the center of the church to exchange the kiss of peace as a sign of their fraternal and brotherly connections as the descendants of the saints Peter and Andrew. Peter, of course, representing the Roman Church, and Andrew symbolically representing the Church of Constantinople. During the liturgy, a precedent was set in that the Pope was invited to recite the Our Father in Greek and to lead the congregation in prayer by himself. During Holy Communion, as the faith will come uh, to the front of the church, you'll notice several of them stopped and made a bow at the throne where Pope Benedict was standing, you can see there. And it, I find it very, very touching that they stopped to pay their respects to the presence of the Pope as they came forward to receive Holy Eucharist. Your Holiness, in remembrance of your blessing. Then at the end of the liturgy, the Patriarch and the Pope exchange greetings and gifts. We offer to you this holy gospel, on the first page of which is described, be imitators of Christ. Let us be therefore imitators of our common Lord and Savior, praying and working together for love, unity, and peace to prevail in our churches and in the whole world. As we just heard, the Patriarch is presenting Pope Benedict with a Gospel book as the gift remembrance of his visit. And the Pope in turn presents Patriarch Bartholomew with a chalice set, a chalice and a discos, a patent, also as remembrance of his visit. Cantors and people then started to sing God grant you many years in Greek to the Pope and the Patriarch here at the conclusion of the liturgy. I would just comment that this visit of Pope Benedict was one of only a few ever d done in history. In the first millennium, when the churches were in communion, there were three visits of popes to Constantinople. After the schism, there were no visits until the ground was broken by the meeting of Patriarch Athenagoras and Pope Paul VI in Jerusalem. And shortly thereafter, Pope Paul VI visited Constantinople, the Ecumenical Patriarch Kate, in the year 1967. And the only other visit besides this one was by Pope John Paul II for the Feast of St. Andrew again in November of 1979. Only three times in the 20th century has a Pope visited Constantinople uh, and only since the 1960s has this occurred. And before that we have to go back over a thousand years when such an event happened again. And then at the end of the singing 
the Pope and the Patriarch will give a joint blessing, again in all four directions, of all of the gathered faithful and clergy that were present for this historic event. Hope you've enjoyed these excerpts of the visit of Pope Benedict to Constantinople. And now we'll go on to our next segment uh, for this program. It's uh, again going to be a plenary session from the Oriental Illumin 12 conference held in Washington, D.C. and San Diego on the theme of feasts and the feast days of the church. And our speaker for this segment is Father Tom Loya. So, Father Tom, why don't you tell us a little bit about what we're going to hear from you in your introduction in that in Well, that in session. case you haven't heard enough of me already in this program, we're going to hear even more in the next few minutes if you want to stay with us. And basically, Jack, the point I was making in my presentation was not just the feast day themselves, I mean, it included that, but it was about their significance, their relevancy to today, especially because they bring us into a certain correct rhythm of life, a rhythm that we've lost today, and it is essential to regain. And it's the feast days of the church, the liturgical calendar of the church, that actually ushers us back into that correct, beautiful rhythm of life. So, let's see about this rhythm of life by way of the feast days of the church. Thank you, Grace. They, I'm always happy to have other guests on my, on my radio program, Lay of the East, so uh, if you see me approaching you, asking for your card and so on, as, you, as I just did for Sister, <laughs> uh, be a part of it. Uh, we've had a number of you on there, and also you may have also heard the voice of Father Maximos, who has uh, also joined us on Lay of the East. My other program is on internet, and basically what it is, is Bishop Samra mentioned, it's applying the spirituality of human sexuality to hot button issues, but another way for me to say it actually, if you listen to it is, it's taking the spirituality of liturgy and applying it to the hot button issues. And you'll see what I mean if you, if you tune in. Last night, I wasn't here because I had to do a feast day. Not only just talk a little bit about it, but I had to do it at my parish, a feast of course, the Nativity of St. John the Baptist. And for those of you who are pastors, what happens whenever you say, we have a holy day this week, a feast day? What happens usually? What's a common question? Especially in our church, or I can speak for the Athenian Byzantine Catholic Church, since the 19, well, probably the mid-1960s, we went on this obligation versus non-obligation system. Right? It's usually the question, you know, what, is it an obligation? Right? You know, what's happened to feast days today? That's the title of my presentation. Why feast days today? Why are they significant? Why are they not very well attended for the most part, especially if they fall during the week? How do we approach it pastorally? What do we do? Last night in my parish, we had a San Diego night type weather. We had all the doors open in the parish and the church. We had liturgy and it was just great. And I asked the people, you know, this is a gorgeous night, unusually beautiful for this time in Chicago. It usually be hot and steamy. And I said, you know, why are we here? We could be, most people could be somewhere else on a beautiful summer night. But why are we here? Why isn't everybody else here? The answer to that question and sort of the dilemma that we face in our world is just that, a world view. A world view. And I believe that feast days do something that is vital to our world today. Not only to parish life, but to the world, to our culture, to, our, to Western civilization. Western civilization, our modern day, I believe, is in need of, I'm going to call this, going back to school. Let's have the next slide. Spelled S-C-H-O-L with the period. It's going back to school. What I mean by that is this. The sacramental, Catholic, human, orthodox, original, liturgical worldview. In other words, the feast days 
are a way of very tangibly drawing people, our people and our parishes, but eventually, you know, really our culture, into an experience of the reality of the incarnation, that God is with us. And I think that feast days are going to provide for us something that is missing, something that's vital. And there's eight things. First thing is, feast days enable us to draw us into the idea of a participation in the great mystery, the rhythm of life, a sense of patrimony authority, a theological anthropology, a sense of human destiny, the reality of the incarnation, the spousal mystery, and the proper balanced approach to the environment. These eight things are things that I see lacking in our culture today, which feast days the entrance in the, the feast days, celebration of the feast days, I believe, help to bring back into our culture. The first one, the participation in the great mystery. The feast days kind of combine this world and the next. They have, enable us to sort of touch God. They kind of bring us beyond the veil. They make real the scriptures. They make real the saints. They make real that event or that person whom we are celebrating. I mean, tangible. There's sort of a meeting point of the next life and this life via the feast days, by the text, by the liturgy, the, the gestures, the customs, the, the saints, the iconography. And it gives a sense of mystery, which is terribly lack in our culture today. And I think it's one of the great geniuses, the great gifts of the Eastern Church, Eastern spirituality, the sense of mystery, which of course means something revealed and something hidden all at the same time. And life is lived in that tension, in that tension of paradox, which for me as an artist, designer, I really appreciate the, I know as I said earlier this afternoon, this came later, the icon screen as we know it. But I think there's a marvelous tension here that brings home a fact of life that we're missing today. That life is about something revealed, but something not revealed. You know, almost, but not yet. And we live in that tension. And we want everything to be either or. You know, we have a very difficult time experiencing life as both and. And I think the fact that our liturgy kind of exists right in this tension point is a vital experience for people today. For, for the, an experience of reality, of, of a, a kind of a healthy psycho-spiritual sense of life. Life is mystery. Something revealed, something concealed. A lot of people say sometimes, there's will come and they'll say, we can't see the priest. They can't understand this. And I say, well, good. I say, but you do see me. You do see the priest when you're supposed to. There's a beautiful rhythm. It's both and, it's not either or. It's not we're never seeing him or we're always seeing him. It's what life really is. It's mystery. It's both and, and you live in that tension. And I think feast days bring us into that reality that is so needed today. I think the, probably, to me, the single greatest contribution that the Eastern spirituality makes to the Western world is that sense of mystery, of what mystery means. Not, not meaning who done it, but something revealed, the invisible made visible through the physical. The second thing is a rhythm of life. Now, I call it the bell curve. Life has a kind of a rhythm to it, most things in life. There's sort of a gathering, a rising action, a climactic point, a falling action, kind of a resolution, then it repeats itself. And this sort of bell curve, you'll see it in almost any discipline of life. You'll see it in life itself, in liturgy especially, in great stories, romance, lovemaking, music. Everything that, almost every discipline in life has this sense of the bell curve, this sort of rising up climactic point and a falling action resolution. Now this is essential. Because in our culture, we tend to live in a kind of a full go thrust and then 
a crash landing. And probably the greatest example of that is how we celebrate Christmas. You know, there's just this obsessive, compulsive push to this cliff. And then December 26th, we drop off that cliff. And we wonder why the, the next two weeks in America are the weeks that boast of the highest degree of suicide and depression. As tragic as that is, it makes perfect sense. Because what we're doing is insane. It's going against what is this natural rhythm, which we see in everything, music, stories, you know, great symphonies, art, even, even visual art, is, a, is that movement upward, a climactic point, and a rising, and a falling action. And the feast days enter us into that rhythm, that healthy human rhythm of life, by means of preparation, pre-festive, fasting, cleansing, <coughs> moving into the feast day itself, then the post-festive, sort of a moving out of it. And it's that bell curve rhythm. It makes beautiful sense, beautiful human sense. Not a rush to something, the climax, and then falling off the edge. Early in our program, we talked about pilgrimage and a custom of pilgrimage that is very dear, very much a part of the tradition of many Eastern churches. But pilgrimage is not just the place we go to. It can actually be the journey of a heart, the journey of our heart, the journey of our soul. And that's the theme of our next presenter, one of our favorites, Bishop John Michael Boitin, who is the bishop for the Romanian Byzantine Catholic Churches in Canada and in America. Howdy, Pilgrim. Um, glad you're back. I uh, was talking last time a little bit about who I was and about some of the people that I kind of were, were inspired by uh, in terms of thinking through what it was that I wanted to do with this time. And I mentioned Leon Blois, I mentioned Andy Rooney, and I mentioned Sister Vasa Laren. But now I think I'm going to talk a little bit more detail about perhaps what inspires me to live a Christian life. Leon Blois couldn't figure out why he was starving to death as a journalist, while many others in France were living a life of ease. He couldn't figure it out because we were all supposed to be fellow Catholics, and to him that, that, meant, that meant something about how we were supposed to look after each other and care for one another. But because he was who he was, and because he wrote the very bitter and acerbic kinds of things that he did, his specialty as a journalist was what you might call spiritual gastric reflux. He gave people heartburn. And because he did that, people had to think. He didn't sell a lot of books. He didn't sell a lot of columns. But he came up with some ideas that were very, very important. And that main idea, the one that hit me when I was youngest, that the greatest tragedy in life, this is something that he wrote, the greatest tragedy in life is not to become a saint. That stuck with me. So I figured, okay, here I am. I'm trying to become a saint. And you're probably trying to become a saint too. Or if you're not, I think you should think about that. But what that means for me is different than what it means for you because one of the things that we know for certain is that God has called each one of us by name out of nothing has into existence for a dream and a destiny that is God's for us to discover and to live. But as we do that, we don't do that by ourselves, we do that together. And this together is what we call the Catholic Church. So with these few minutes that I want to spend in front of a camera from time to time, I figure I'm mostly talking to Catholics. And that probably means mostly Roman Catholics. Roman Catholics typically don't know a whole lot, the research unfortunately shows this, about Eastern Catholics. So I'm going to be talking to you about who we are, because I'm an Eastern Catholic. I'm also going to be talking to Eastern Catholics, my other fellow Eastern Catholics, to remember one thing. There's no reason to feel any kind of an inferiority complex when you're convinced that God loves you, that the Father of all cares for you, loves you infinitely, nonviolently, unconditionally, and eternally. And so when we're about the same stuff that we're supposed to be about as Catholics, as every other Catholic, and that's kind of the point of what I'm saying, there is no reason to feel like a second-class citizen or in any way inferior 
We're called to the same kind of activity as Catholics as any other Christian. Byzantines, or at least Romanian Byzantines, hear about that every liturgy that's celebrated because we hear Matthew 5, every, every liturgy, the Beatitudes. We know that we're called to be poor in spirit. We know that we're called to hunger and thirst after justice. We know that we're called to be peacemakers. And on and on. We know that we call to the same thing as every other Christian in the 25th chapter of St. Matthew. To feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to visit the sick and the imprisoned. We know that we're called, like every other Christian in Matthew 28, to go forth and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, says the Lord. And we know that we are called, like every other Christian, like every other human being, to become by grace, by God's grace, what God is by nature, a process that you probably have already heard about called theosis or divinization. Which means if God is love, that means becoming what love is, as we read in the first uh, letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 13. Love is always patient and kind. It is never jealous. Love is never boastful or conceited. It is not rude or selfish. It does not take offense and is not resentful. Love takes no pleasure in other people's sins, but delights in the truth. And if we want to be love, that's what we want to be like. We must always, like love, be ready to excuse, to trust, to hope, and to endure whatever comes. And this part's important. Love does not come to an end. Christ is risen. Our survival is guaranteed. We do not come to an end either. There are specifically Eastern Christian ways of looking about looking at that and exploring that, and maybe we'll get into that a little bit here. But like I said, this is my show, and I'm going to use it to rant or to answer questions or to do whatever I want. I hope that I have a chance to hear from you in the future. Uh, you'll have to get in touch with me in care of this show. We've got a few things in mind, but if we're all on a pilgrimage together, and I think we all are, I think you'll have as much to share with me as I have to share with you. And so I invite you to continue with me on this pilgrimage. And as you come along, don't forget to pack a lunch. But bring enough to share, because I think we're all going to be hungry on the way. Thanks, and we'll see you next time. Well, I hope you've enjoyed Bishop John Michael. I hope you've enjoyed our whole program. And I hope you'll tell your friends about our program, and I hope you'll tune in for subsequent programs, because we've got a lot more to share with you. In his 1995 apostolic letter, Oriental Lumen, which means Light of the East, John Paul II called the whole church to learn about the riches of the Eastern churches, so as to be enriched by them and to work towards unity in the whole church. And that is precisely our motive and our message on this program of Theosis. If you'd like more information about the videos, clips that you've seen in today's segment, uh, you can have a look at our streaming video website at www.oltv.tv or if you would be interested in purchasing some of our CDs or DVDs of these programs and many, many others. We now have over 300 shows uh, that we recorded over the last five years. Uh, those are all available for purchase at the online catalog of olconference.com. So thanks again for joining us. We hope you've enjoyed this program uh, and we hope to see you again soon and Zbohom which means go with God.
имя святое Его, благослови Господь.